deputy vice chancellors, executive deans of faculty, and particularly we greet our executive dean of health sciences tonight, Professor Zugiswa Zingela. Uh, we greet colleagues in the faculty of health sciences, uh, the school of nursing, uh, here and beyond, uh, professors and all members of the academy here in present, members of senior management, students, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, family members, friends and colleagues uh, who are sharing this evening with us online. I am very pleased to welcome you all this evening on the occasion of the inaugural lecture of Professor Joanne Naidu. I particularly wish to acknowledge and welcome Professor Naidu's family and extended family and friends, especially her husband, Neil, their daughter, Alexandra, and parents, Raymond and Rosemary Kirsten, whose ongoing love and support have undoubtedly contributed to this momentous achievement. We share in your joy and pride on this special occasion. A special welcome also goes to Professor Naidu's friends and colleagues in the Faculty of Health Sciences and in the Nursing Science Fraternity, who have journeyed with her, supported and encouraged her on the road to this high point in her career. It is indeed a cause for rejoicing and celebration. Tonight, colleagues, we also pay homage to all the colleagues uh, of Professor Naidu from her former institutions, particularly UKZN, and to your global network of collaborators, Professor. We all know that support of family, friends, and colleagues stands at the core of our success as individuals. They are our anchors, they are our refuge, and at times, they are our shepherds and mentors who help us to refocus, to re-energize, and to re-enthuse when our energies have flagged and when we have needed the occasional nudge in the right direction. Let me congratulate you, Professor, on your outstanding achievement. Being promoted to the level of a full professor is the pivotal affirmation of your accomplishments as an academic and as a scholar. Ladies and gentlemen, it is always a matter of personal pride and pleasure when one of our own is acknowledged by their peers in the academic community. While Professor Naidu has been with us for just over four years, she has become an established scholar of global repute uh, that we are very proud of here at Mandela. Here at Mandela, Professor, you have quickly made your mark and firmly established yourself not only as a leader in your field of nursing science, but also as an astute research professional and as an asset to our Faculty of Health Sciences, the academy as a whole, and to the communities in whose name we exist. The focus of your research, the negative impact of stigmatization on health outcomes, is, in my view, not only critical as a scientific endeavor, and the research enterprise, but it plays an important role in addressing itself to issues of injustice, of marginality, and ve various fragilities faced by mainly the poorest in our society. Professor Naidu's work is scaffolded by a formidable teaching, consultation, and publications record, as well as various forms of, an, of engaged scholarship. This is testament to her enduring commitment to expanding the body of work in her chosen field, while making sure that this work finds practical and immediate expression and relevance to those living with preca precarities and practitioners that care for them. We are indeed honored that at this point in your career, you are part of the Nelson Mandela University family. We are proud of your accomplishments, and we are eagerly looking forward to listening to your lecture this evening. Congratulations once again from myself, Professor. Good evening, colleagues. I now call upon Professor Zugiswa Zingela, 
the executive dean of the faculty of health sciences to introduce uh, our inaugural uh, speaker this evening. Thank you. I wish to thank our vice chancellor and greetings. I would also like to thank everybody who's given us the time for this auspicious occasion. And uh, am especially proud because Professor Joanne Naidu is in the Faculty of Health Sciences. To give a background of Professor Joanne Rachel Naidu, when I go through her CV, one will immediately be able to tell that she's not just a mother, a wife, a trusted colleague, a friend, but she's also a woman of, of significance. If you'll excuse me, I'm going to take off my mask so that everybody can hear me very well. Thank you. So in summary, Professor Joanne Naidu joined the Nelson Mandela University Department of Nursing Science um, in April 2017. Prior to this, she had worked for over 15 years at the Department of Nursing at the University of KwaZulu-Natal initially in a research support role for various community-based research projects, which included a multi-country study on HIV-related stigma in South Africa, and other Southern African countries were involved as collaborators. She went on to become a lecturer in nursing research and a postgraduate research coordinator. While at University of KwaZulu-Natal, Joanne completed a coursework master's in nursing research and a PhD in nursing, which focused on establishing communities of practice through the use of critical reflection among nurses providing care for women living with HIV. Joanne further completed the Health Professions Fellowship in 2014 with the Southern African Fema Re Regional Institute, or SAFRI. She is registered as a nurse educator and professional nurse and midwife with the South African Nursing Council and is a member of various professional and research bodies. Joanne has also been recognized for her knowledge and skills through the consultancy role, workshop presentation, and guest lectures that she has delivered. She's also participated in various curriculum reviews and designs for masters in nursing programs in Lesotho, Congo, Brazzaville, Gabon, and Seychelles. She has also been involved in terms of integrating HIV within a Bachelor of Nursing curriculum through the MEPI initiative. Joanne has published widely in the field of nursing and HIV-related stigma in over 35 articles in accredited journals, several book chapters, conferences, keynote addresses, and supervising to completion over 25 doctoral and master's students whose work reflect a shared research interest. Joanne continues to facilitate health sciences research through her contribution as Director of Research for the Faculty of Health Sciences since 2020, an external examiner for research and ethics modules at several um, um, HEIs, as well as um, in the country. She is also a journal reviewer and an external examiner for over 20 masters and doctoral studies. In terms of educational qualifications, um, Joanne has a PhD in nursing from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, a Master's of Nursing, um, also from the University of KwaZulu-Natal, Bachelor of Nursing, University of Natal, post-basic diploma in nursing education from the University of Natal, higher certificate in health professions education um, via South Africa, FIMA uh, Regional Institute. Certificate in Moderation of Outcomes-Based Education, also from KwaZulu-Natal Training Center. In terms of professional experience, uh, she is a professor of nursing at Mandela University from 2019 to date. Bef uh, she's also a director of health science research within the Faculty of Health Sciences. This is a three-year secondment, uh, which Joanne started with us in January 2020 to date. She, she was previously an associate professor of nursing at Nelson Mandela University from 2017 to 2019, also a lecturer uh, nursing research at the University of KwaZulu-Natal 2009 to 2016, 
She was a postgraduate research coordinator at the School of Nursing at University of, of KwaZulu-Natal and also a research project coordinator at University of KwaZulu-Natal. In terms of research and teaching experience, she has collaborated across different countries, has had um, collaborations and teachings in the Seychelles, as mentioned before, Gabon and Congo Brazzaville, including a new partnership for Africa development, um, which looked at a situational analysis as part of the project to upscale nursing and midwifery education. She's collaborated in Lesotho, uh, via the National University of Lesotho, and also with Canadian partners, uh, that is the Canadian International Development Agency, where they were commissioned um, to evaluate research on the Canadian and Africa Caring for the Care, Carer HIV project. Um, also, Johan has been the recipient of the Fogarty NIH grant, um, UCSF and UKZN, uh, which looked at the perceived um, AIDS stigma, which was a multinational African study. This was a longitudinal study conducted which explored the meaning and measurement of HIV stigma and its impact on the quality of life for nurses and for people living with HIV. Medical Research Council um, has also um, had Joanne's input by the rapid assessment of HIV and AIDS in the minibus taxi industry in KwaZulu-Natal. Um, she's also looked at the influence of pregnancy on the progression of HIV AIDS in women in South Africa. Uh, Joanne has also been involved in the multi-country case study of health promotion of lifestyle diseases within the minibus taxi industry. In terms of research development and support, Joanne has published over 35 peer-reviewed papers in accredited journals, several conference uh, presentations in national and in international conferences, three keynote addresses at regional nursing and health-related conferences, and several book chapters. She has supervised over 25 doctoral and master's students. Without further ado, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I give you our woman of significance, Professor Joanne Naidu. Good evening, Vice Chancellor. Good evening, Deputy Dean. Permit me to remove my mask so that I'm audible. Good evening and thank you for allowing me to share a reflection on the body of work that I have been involved in. Before I commence, the title of my lecture for this evening is entitled Stigma, Syndemics, Symbolic Isms in the Context of HIV, Knowing How to Care. It is incredibly humbling to share this space with so many prolific scholars whose work continue to shape the nursing and health sciences scholarship. And so this achievement is through acknowledgement of peers, as Vice Chancellor has indicated, in the discipline and also my colleagues within the university who have reviewed the body of work that I have co-created with students and with colleagues and determined that it is significant for me to meet this milestone. It is an honor that I recognize and the responsibility that comes with this and endeavor to continue to build on nursing and health sciences scholarship. And so it is in that occasion that I would just like to reflect for a few minutes my appreciation and acknowledgement. And I have intentionally used uh, an image of a tree, symbolic in a sense that a tree is rooted and enables um, growth 
And so in like manner, there are many individuals that have shaped and have had impressions on my career and on my life. The first is to acknowledge Nelson Mandela University. To the management within the university, to the management in the Faculty of Health Sciences, to my colleagues within the Department of Nursing. It is noted that I joined just over four years ago. And I think the first word that comes to mind is a sense of belongingness and family. And that is what has been created and has allowed this platform for me to be able to be acknowledged in this manner. And similar to a tree that is rooted and starts, its seed starts germinating in a particular place or in a soil, in like manner, I want to recognize colleagues past and present within the University of KwaZulu-Natal, within the Fraternity of Nursing in KwaZulu-Natal, that have also had an impression on my career and in the work that I'm involved in. And then to students whose work continue to shape my own work as we co-create and co-learn with one another. I also want to especially recognize my family. Um, their, their presence and their outpouring of love um, continue to guide me. And in particular, I want to recognize family and friends that are virtually watching this from beyond um, the country and from KwaZulu-Natal. And I want to especially recognize my husband, Neil, and my daughter, Alexandra, my parents, my brother, and extended family. So with such an occasion, one positions themselves within the research. And I want to reflect on two moments that have enabled me to reflect on the work that I'm going to present on this evening. We call this research paradigms, which is in its very fundamental term, a view or a lens with which we view the world or the reality in which we want to see or enables us to see our research gap. And so the first moment I want to reflect on started um, just about 20 years ago. Um, and this was through the work um, Prof. Sengele has shared uh, in terms of assessing and describing HIV amongst women in KwaZulu-Natal. This study enabled us to um, look at the progression of HIV um, amongst pregnant and non-pregnant women. But in particular, it's shaped and framed my understanding of stigma in the sense that it allowed me to see the interconnectedness between social support, health behavior, and how each one interacts with one another in terms of women living with HIV. I've intentionally shared the map of KwaZulu-Natal to highlight the health districts. This two-year study took place within the Utukela region that is generally regarded or becomes likened to the majestic Drakensberg Mountains. But within this health district, also the inequities of health becomes more pronounced. The remoteness of the province in terms of access to healthcare facilities was one of the most vivid images that I recall. The second, a comparative um, health district was Etekweni. And so if we reflect on the white and on the very bright green, very similar to the colors of our faculty, um, you can see the distance between both of these sites. 
The second moment, um, or, the, or embedded within the first moment, was then my involvement within um, the multinational uh, study that looked at the progression of or, or measuring HIV uh, across time, across countries, and looked at it in terms of measurements, so assessing how HIV interacts with um, other other variables that we would call it. So other intersecting um, dynamics or facets that interact with stigma. And some of this was like looking at the quality of life of an individual, looking at um, their health and well-being, looking at depressive disorders, and also looking at symptom management. And so this allowed me to then frame the first aspect within my title, which is the symbolic interactionism. A tongue of cheek, if you will, because I've separated symbolic and isms, and we'll come to that a little later. So that was the first framing of the manner in which I started to understand and I started to frame my lens with which I've seen stigma. The second positioning um, came through my doctoral study um, under the supervision of also a nurse educator. Um, and Professor Charlie's guidance in understanding education principles allowed me to then start framing the second paradigm of the lens with which I see HIV-related stigma. I recall the many iterations as one would reflect on their PhD proposals of trying to understand what's the significance of this. And she would often say to me, I understand your enthusiasm for women living with HIV, but what's the significance for nursing? You're doing a PhD in nursing. And so that question, while it bothered me for a while, also enabled me to see the significance of what we do in understanding clinical manifestations of a disease, social or psychological manifestations of that, and how we as healthcare providers respond to that. And so that framing, that educational lens, then enabled me to, as we've heard from my um, uh, summary of my CV, that it, it enabled me to look at the manner in which critical reflection, peer-supported learning enables healthcare providers, specifically nurses, who most often are working in remote settings, may not have access to continuous professional development and education on how they can co-learn with one another and thereby to enhance the level of care that's provided. And so it is in this stance that I then share my lecture outline. There are three aspects that will be covered within this lecture. The first is on the interconnectedness of stigma, of HIV, and other stigmatized facets. The second then blends in ways of knowing, and really poses a question, a critical question if we would like to call it that, in terms of how does our understanding and the magnitude of work that has been covered within HIV-related stigma frames or changes the narrative in which we respond to that so that we can start to close the gap of, of HIV-related stigma still perpetuating the disease. And then the third is in terms of ongoing work and research in terms of stigma consciousness and our responsibilities particularly in terms of education and training. And what is our call in terms of the way we craft curriculums that starts to address such um, aspects of stigma?
So we start with a reflection on the burden of HIV in South Africa. I think against the global experiences in the past year and a half in terms of, COVID, of the COVID-19 pandemic, we as a country know all too well the experiences of another pandemic, a global pandemic that has contributed to almost 36 million people that have died due to HIV. Um, and, and this is since the start of the pandemic more than four decades ago. According to the United Nations 2020 report, it indicates that, and this is what's projected on your screen, that roughly 1.7 million new infections of HIV was seen within the reporting year of 2019. And that within this body of the number of people living with HIV, we have 27 and a half million people who are accessing antiretroviral therapy. And this is global statistics. And then if we turn our attention to the national landscape, reflected against the July's Statistics South Africa reporting their annual mid-year report, it's estimated that there are 8.2 million people living with HIV in the country, and of which 19.5%, so close to 20% of this, are adults between the ages of 15 and 49 years. And in terms of HIV-related death or AIDS-related death, there was a decrease from where the peak of the pandemic was in 2007, where we roughly saw around 274,000 deaths per year related to HIV. And so it has significantly decreased in 2020, where we've noted a notable decrease to 79,000. But then if one reflects on 2021 20, statistics, and one can extend our thinking to the COVID-19 pandemic that has altered access to care, perhaps, we see that there is about 85,000 people that have died from HIV or AIDS-related death. Moreover, despite efforts to mitigate the, eff the effects of COVID-19, we see that there was a decline in the annual number of clients that remained on antiretroviral therapy. And there was a decrease of this by about 4%. As part of the global initiative, the Joint United Nations Program on HIV and AIDS, which is more commonly known as the 1990-90 strategy towards eliminating HIV by 2020, and now the 95-95-95 strategy to eliminate HIV by 2030. When we reflect on our statistics in relation to these trends, we see that for 2019, which is reported in the 2020 reports, um, there is about 92% of all people who are living with HIV that are aware of their status. And 70% of all people living with HIV are accessing antiretroviral therapy. And 64% of the total number of people living with HIV have a viral load suppression. And so if we reflect on the targets of 1990, we can see that while individuals know their HIV status, there remains a challenge in terms of accessing antiretroviral therapy and sustained care or continuum of care within um, antiretroviral therapies. We note that women in particular are more vulnerable or at higher risk of HIV infection. And in 2020, within the sub-Saharan African region, 
you see that six in every seven new infections were among girls aged 15 to 19 years, and approximately 4,200 women, young women between ages 15 to 24 years, are infected with HIV every week. So Vice Chancellor, if I look at those numbers, that's roughly saying each month, the Madiba Stadium is roughly full of girls within the age of 15 to 24 years um, that are infected each month. So over the years, and as we move our attention to the syndemic nature of HIV and stigma, we need to recognize that over the years, there has been considerable efforts and advancement in the care and treatment related to HIV. This has contributed significantly to the increased life expectancy. Um, and we see this in terms of our Statistics South Africa reporting that the, the increased life expectancy amongst women has increased to just about 65 years and for men, are roughly around 62 years of age. Um, and we also see significant changes in that um, HIV is now regarded as a more manageable and a chronic illness. And as such, we need to reflect then on co-occurring illnesses that may be more predisposed to people living with HIV or related to the continuum of care. So as the population of individuals living with HIV age, we may find also um, natural illnesses in terms of aging also manifesting. But one of the most frequently occurring, co-occurring or comorbidity that is also stigmatized is related to mental health illnesses, depressive disorders, neurological disorders, and tuberculosis, and cancer, to name but a few that confound this continuum burden of care. And so what we have understood with research and when we look at the discourses of research is that HIV is multifaceted um, and it has its dimensions in terms of all aspects of society. So while it is a biological disease, it is also a social disease. And so we begin to understand and we have come to understand this dynamics in terms of how HIV is a sociological, psychological, cultural, spiritual, e and economic disease. And it has manifestations on all of these domains. The interrelated effects of HIV on the psychosocial facets of a person's functioning has been extensively researched, and we see this through the iterations of numerous uh, validated tools that enables us to correlate both HIV functioning or individuals functioning with HIV in relation to some of these attributes that I present here. And this is not all encompassing, some of which is self-efficacy, quality of life, or the quality of work life, looking at aspects of resilience, spiritual well-being, symptom management, coping strategies, and psychological distress. And it has also enabled us to understand which of these are more high risk in terms of drivers for stigma. It is also within this understanding that within not only nursing but health sciences in particular, we start to see certain models such as our health belief model or theories of reasoned action or planned behavior or social cognitive theories that then becomes more prominent as we start to understand the interfaces between these constructs and how perceived risk to particular areas fuels behavior.
of all of these dynamics, stigma still remains one of the greatest burdens to eradicating or eliminating HIV. It is often a hidden burden of disease and it is regarded as something that negates and diminishes health outcomes, health seeking patterns, quality of life amongst people living with HIV, as well as extended communities, so those who are associated with individuals that are living with HIV as well. Stigma is also associated with hesitancy for HIV testing, for disclosure of status, either to significant others, family, friends, or healthcare providers. It also interacts negatively with antiretrovirals uh, therapy in terms of non-adherence or reluctance to commence treatment. And we've also started to see that within this realm of, of um, transitioning, so as, as we start to see uptake and longevity within the antiretroviral therapy program, we start seeing that adolescents in particular who may have been born with HIV through mother to child transmission, they in particular are more vulnerable because of the transitioning from uh, care that is predominantly within the care of their significant others, the parent or primary caregiver, and as they transition into adult care. The internal processes of sometimes often themselves finding out of their diagnosis at the time that they're transitioning into adult care, and then their own internalized stigma or their own internalized processes um, against which they start to begin to understand living with this long-term illness. And often we find that this is the biggest driver for continuum of care, especially amongst adolescents. So understanding the role of stigma is then critical for us as healthcare providers to change this narrative. We also see that um, stigma is socially influenced and is a manifestation of a process wherein an individual is considered as having an attribute or a trait that is belonging to an entity, a community, or an area of living even that is considered undesirable undesirable. And the work here of many stigma-related theorists, in particular Irving uh, Goffman, has shaped our understanding of seeing stigma as a discrediting trait, works that he has called the spoilt identity. We've also seen that in certain contexts, and, and some of the work that has been produced has also shown that in particular, rural settings are more stigmatized than urban settings in terms of HIV. Um, and so we start to see the ecological effects as well of HIV-related stigma. We also start to see the dynamics between cultural norms, beliefs, and values that are related to the understanding of HIV. And so we see that Stigma is then perpetuated by power. And so it is within this that you find that as power is manifested in society, those that perceive themselves as not having this undesirable trait or not belonging to a particular entity or a group that is regarded as having a spoilt identity, then starts to create a process which we have come to know as othering, an us and a them. And these systems start to create a grounding for inequities. It is within this grounding that we start seeing labels beginning to perpetuate. If I reflect on the work that we commenced some 20 years ago, um, some of the terms that was used 
to refer to an individual who was living with HIV. Some quite derogatory, some to symbolically refer to a fast-paced life, perhaps, like winning the lotto, WWW, all of which were labels but were used to perpetuate this othering. Within our current cons context, we also see labels of us and them being perpetuated. We see this being manifested in terms of phobias, phobias around gender nonconformity, phobias around sexual orientation, phobias around age, phobias and isms start also determining our narrative in terms of how we care for individuals living with HIV. And so it is within this interaction that we then become more mindful of, we become more mindful of these triggers and the drivers and the process around HIV related stigma. The first of which I want to discuss um, comes through, and if you allow me to talk to this particular slide. It is an interpretation of reviews that have been published, an interpretation of work that I have co-created with other colleagues, and also in terms of uh, work that has been uh, researched in terms of um, directives, so from WHO or the UNAIDS. And so the first within this is reflecting the centeredness, and I would like to just draw our attention to that. And that's the centeredness of HIV-related stigma. Inherent in this is the person, and the person who's living with um, initially the HIV um, diagnosis or disease, and then also co-occurring illnesses. I've deliberately positioned it in the center of this um, diagram or figure to show that central to whatever we understanding about manifestations of diseases is still the, si is still the person the person who's the holder of, um, of these experiences. We start to see that um, the first is, is these rather odd looking arrows. Um, and these are, the, and, and I've intentionally um, put them inward facing because these are facets or drivers um, and what we call syndemics. And so the term syndemic refers to co-occurring. Initially it was co-occurring diseases, but a syndemic has also become understood and the discourses around um, the biopsychosocial understanding of diseases has also positioned syndemics to refer to uh, attributes within the context that can interact with a disease. So we start to see that these syndemics impact and they influence the person who is living with HIV. The first I want to refer to looks at the power, the labeling, the othering. It's often the person who is within this uh, society or community that starts to receive a shift in power gradient. Um, it, it could be from their own peers, it could be from their family members, it could be from colleagues. So it is within their own society or their own community first that the manifestation of othering starts to occur, this divide between an us and a them. And the first 
um, reaction to that, or the first process to that, is exclusion. Often self-exclusion, so the individual themselves starts to isolate themselves, and the, the othering, that process, the us and the them, also starts to create exclusions. The second syndemic, which we have spoken about and has been extensively researched, I think more than any of the other syndemics, is the psychosocial, and now more recently, the psychosocial ecological attributes of, um, of, of HIV-related stigma. So this refers to a person's mental health well-being. It refers to the manner in which their coping strategies, so the manner in which they perceive their risk to their outcome. And so we start seeing aspects related to substance abuse manifest within this realm. The second, or the third, sorry, is then co-occurring illnesses. Um, and co-occurring illnesses are also very often stigmatized illnesses. So I want to just pause here because while we reflect on the numbers and while we reflect on the number of, of adolescents who are infected with HIV, as we should, as the numbers project, a gap within our understanding, in particular for women, is also women who are older. And by older, and forgive me, colleagues, virtually who is also listening to this, the literature, not myself, defines older women as someone over the age of 50. <laughs> and so we start to see a gap in terms of how we cater for older women living with HIV and, and the aspects related to reproductive health. And so within this month where there's an awareness, particularly around breast cancer, we also need to reflect on cervical cancer and screening around that and how many women avoid accessing such services, again related to the stigmatized co-occurring illness. And then we have lastly what I call the structural, and literature also confirms this, a structural syndemic. This is where, sadly, the healthcare facilities perpetuate stigma or perpetuate stigma experiences. And I want to be bold enough to position myself within structure while I have for many years not been in a clinical space, I need to reflect on what is my structure. And my structure is the classroom. My structure is my virtual team sessions, the manner in which I interact with um, nursing students or healthcare students, and the nuances that I use in the manner in which I'm describing this disease, the manner in which I'm explaining um, how the disease manifests. And so structure also perpetuates stigma. And so as we continue, each one of us can reflect on this individually in terms of the structure that we are within. Literature extends structure to religious organizations, it extends structures to schools, if we particularly think about adolescent girls, who are pregnant and the, the support that they receive from school, from their schooling facilities. So it can extend, but for the purpose of this presentation and to position myself, I'm referring to structure here in terms of nursing education institutions or in terms of higher education institutions. And then the inverted arrows that are opposite this term of HIV relate or HIV related stigma then refers to the outcomes. Um, what occurs after this process? So while there is interactions, what occurs between these processes? And so the outcomes we see is antiretroviral 
therapy adherence or non-adherence, and we also start to see care retention being diminished. So against this background of understanding the multifaceted nuances, this intricacies between uh, HIV-related stigma in terms of the psychological, social, ecological manifestations of society, what is its relevance to us? And so I reflect on a well-known nursing theorist who has been um, utilized, or the utility of this uh, model has been especially utilized amongst medical doctors or the medical education or health professionals' education. And this is um, Carper's way of knowing. Um, and she and we'll come to this in, in a minute. But I want to just stop here. As I reflected on the policy for delivering such a, a, a lecture this evening, one of it indicates that the, um, the newly appointed professor shares reflections on future work or forward thinking in terms of work. And so it has been a reflective process, Vice Chancellor, to, to marry all of the work that has, not only myself, has contributed with colleagues, but what is known already about HIV-related stigma. There was a recent article, a 2021 article, that says, not another adherence intervention indicating that we understand the nature of this disease called stigma. So how do we intersect with it? Um, how, do we, how do we intersect with it to try to bridge the gap? And the first question is based on how do we come to care? Now that we understand and we, through research that has been produced, better understand this dynamics, how do we better care? How do we know how to care? What frames the knowledge that informs how we care? What are some of the inherent or learned symbolic meanings in how we care? And how do we demystify and eliminate HIV-related stigma? So Carper's work, and then further taken on by researchers uh, or theorists known as Chin and Kramer, have discussed five interrelated constructs. This is the empirical, the ethical, the personal, the aesthetic, and the emancipatory. I initially, colleagues, I want to stop here. I initially read the, the program as perhaps meaning four and a half hours and not 45 minutes. <laughs> and, um, and now I'm getting signals that it was in fact 45 minutes. So thankfully through our colleagues at Mandela University and our exceptional uh, publicity team, the, the um, full lecture is going to also be posted on our website. And it is within this that I've also shared the references. So permit me not to go into each of these interrelated constructs, but to summarize it in saying that what these five constructs uh, proclaim or their assumptions are is that in order for us to provide holistic care, we need to be mindful as healthcare practitioners or educators on all of these dynamics. Empirical meaning being evidence informed, using the most up-to-date information in the manner in which we inform knowledge. Ethical in terms of being underpinned by morals, a moral consciousness. And I think against this evening's presentation, we can see the synergy between ethics and stigma. Personal is that intuition, 
of using oneself in a situation. So we call this the therapeutic use of self. It's being able to use yourself as an instrument of care, to being able to discern that perhaps this individual is not sharing the complete history with me. And that is the personal, relates to also the aesthetic. And then also emancipatory is how through the manner in which we care, we enable individuals who are living with HIV, whose storyline is an undertone of stigma, to be able to decrease their internalized stigma, to decrease the anticipated stigma that often is one of the barriers for them accessing care. And so within this ways of knowing, it recognizes that each patient is, or each individual, I should say, is unique. Each one has their own story of living with HIV. While the attributes may be clinically presenting what the norm should be, we need to recognize that each individual with whom we provide this therapeutic use of self in the manner in which we care is an individual. And so my positioning of stigma and knowing how to care is to recognize that the manner in which we underpin and facilitate the scholarship of learning and teaching should recognize these authentic connections, should recognize ethical decision making, should recognize that as healthcare providers, we co-create solutions with our community. And within this, I've then framed future work. Again, remembering the utterances of my, of my supervisor some many years ago, I ask myself, what relevance does this have to the discipline? When we're engaging with work, we, we often recognize how does the work contribute to, or we call it the significance, how does it contribute to the existing body of knowledge in your profession or in your field? What new knowledge is going to be created with this? And so as I look forward to the next 20 or more years within my career at Mandela University and within this family, I then pose certain areas for us to consider. The first is about stigma consciousness. How do we facilitate learning? How does our curriculum engage with words and symbols, with the language that raises the consciousness of stigma? When we look at curriculums and the integration of HIV within the curriculum, it's often very clinical with very sporadic placements of psychosocial determinants onto the curriculum. We need to amplify our efforts in terms of increasing our consciousness, in terms of how we impact on the next generation of nurse practitioners or healthcare practitioners. The second is an interesting body of work within literature. It's called the role of generational stigma. So it recognizes that myself as an educator, I may be also having stigmatizing prejudice beliefs and the manner in which I subtly engage with learning and teaching can bring about aspects of generational stigma. The third is something that calls for efforts in terms of stigma screening. In like manner that we have mental health screening as part of our assessment, our health case assessment, because the literature indicates that of all the types of stigma, 
internalized stigma or anticipated stigma is the most widely reported forms of stigma, meaning that very often the healthcare provider may not hear the full dynamic of what the person who is accessing care is presenting. So how do we incorporate screening tools as part of our healthcare assessment so that we can start to engage on who is most at risk for non-compliance, who is most at risk for mental health disorders because of a new diagnosis or an ongoing diagnosis of HIV. As I conclude, I am once again completely reminded of this multifaceted dynamics of this hidden disease stigma. And that in order for us to end HIV, and I extend it to all other stigmatized illnesses, it requires a holistic overview of how we come to know how to care. While we can recognize that there are interventions that has been developed and are ongoing in terms of intervening on the individual who is living with HIV, perhaps we need to shift the lens on interventions in the structure and how individuals within the structure may sometimes perpetuate HIV-related stigma or illness-related stigma. And then within, within the nursing and health professions uh, body of work and within our disciplines, what is our role in terms of curriculums? Most of us throughout the country within health professions or uh, particularly within nursing are recurriculating against the new um, against the new um, national qualifications framework and against um, also our professional bodies. This is an opportunity for us to look at the curriculum and look at nuances of stigma consciousness in the manner in which we craft curriculums. While the work continues, I wish to end on a more optimistic note and recognize that we can only reflect as an evening like this on what has been achieved because of the ongoing work that continues, that better informs us and thereby enables us to create more sustainable, more relevant and more appropriate solutions. I wish to thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you. I stand here on behalf of our Deputy Vice-Chancellor for Research, Innovation and Internationalization, Dr. Tandim Gwebi, to congratulate Professor Joanne Naidu, and this I do on behalf of the President of the Alumni Association, and I officially welcome the speaker, Professor Joanne Naidu, into the Alumni Association. With those words, I have the honor of reading the special message from Dr. Tandim Gwibi. Professor Joanne Naidu, it is an absolute pleasure and privilege to congratulate you on behalf of the President of the Alumni Association and officially welcome you into the Alumnus, uh, Alumni Association. And I also thank you very much for an interesting inaugural lecture where you shared your thoughts with us on stigma, syndemics, and symbolism in the context of HIV. 
Thank you for unhiding the hidden disease of stigma that shadows HIV, for enlightening us on aspects of HIV that we do not confront on a daily basis, that of othering when we practice stigma against HIV and people living with HIV. Congratulations on your contribution over many years as an academic in the higher education sector and your impact in the global science and higher education space. I'm particularly intrigued by your work, Professor Naidu, in the sense that syndemics theory is increasingly recognized in social science and medicine as a crucial framework for examining and addressing pathways of interaction between biological and social aspects of chronic and acute suffering in populations. Your work is a true reflection of locally enabled and globally impactful. We are truly privileged to have you at Nelson Mandela University, and we look forward to a most rewarding and productive time, not only as a researcher and scholar, but as an enabler of research product productivity in the Faculty of Health Sciences. You've particularly excelled at, as a researcher. In addition, you are rooted in an actively engaged um, manner in your profession to enhance its knowledge base and in transferring competencies to those working in the profession in this regard. You certainly live out the university's ethos to be in the service of society. In closing, I would like to convey our thanks to those who attended this inaugural lecture virtually, including Professor Joanne Naidu's husband, Professor Joanne Naidu's daughter, friends, and colleagues. Your interest in Prof. Naidu's work and that of Nelson Mandela University is much appreciated. A special thanks to our Vice Chancellor, who opened and welcomed us all, Professor Mutwa. Thank you to Prof. Sengela, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences for introducing Prof. Naidu to us. And last, but by no means least, thanks to the institutional governance team in the Office of our Registrar, our communications and marketing team, and our ICT team that made the virtual inaugural lecture possible. You did a fantastic job. This brings to a close the inaugural lecture of Professor Joanne Naidu. Thank you.